Could you tell a story yeah. of a time where you ignored conventional business advice and it paid off? Um. I'm here at Craft & Commerce, our annual conference for professional creators, and I'm asking creators about a time where they ignored conventional business advice and how it paid off. So the thing that comes to mind is when we first got the idea for my part-time YouTuber academy, which was like the first proper course that I'd made, and I kind of had the idea sitting in a coffee shop one day, and I said to Angus, one of my team members, hey, I've got this idea, and we said, should we just map it out right now. So like the same day, we got out a bunch of post-it notes and just sort of wrote down, uh, wrote things down and figured out what the course was gonna be. And then the following day, we were like, should we just create a landing page? So I spent the whole day creating a landing page. And then within about three days, I was sort of sharing it and posting it on Twitter. And you know, traditional business advice would be that when you're creating a product, you should really speak to the customers, you should validate demand, you should like take your time, you should you know, do things a little bit properly. Um, we just went very scrappy and very quick, and our goal was to go from idea to execution in record time. So within about four or five days, we created the structure of the course, we created the landing page, posted it on Twitter. I was expecting 12 people to sign up for the first beta cohort. In the end, 354 people signed up for the beta cohort. We did, I don't know, like a quarter of a million dollars in revenue within a week, and that's more money than I'd ever seen in my entire life. That would have been five years of a salary working as a doctor because I had just quit my job full-time in medicine and I was like, my mind was blown. And then we had 350 people in this thing and so we were sort of like building it as we went along and doing things at the very, very, very last minute and it all came together really well. And I think had we spent more time preparing it and more time thinking, uh-oh, this needs to be a good product, we probably never would have released it because we, we would have been mired in like overthinking and perfectionism and like, oh, there's always more we could add. But the fact that we sort of forced ourselves to build it as we went along with paying customers actually meant that there was so much energy in that cohort, people loved it. The WhatsApp groups are still active to this day, like four years later, and that ended up being a sort of $3 million a year business that's still continuing to this day. We now take our time a little bit more. Now we're sort of in the mode of go slow to go fast. But back then, kind of move fast and break things was very much our, our MO, and I think that really helped. I think a lot of people talk about like the first mover advantage and like the best time to be on YouTube was like 2014 before it got crowded. I think there's a truth about the second mover advantage. And what I mean by that is that there's so much stuff to study now and to adapt. And you could see, especially if you look outside your industry, of what's taking off, what's an outlier video, especially if you look at, okay, if I'm looking up a topic or a niche, what's a video that outperformed a channel subscriber count? And what was it about that video? And can I blend and adapt that for my own purpose? Because YouTube has already given you so much data, why not study it? adapt it. And by the way, like second mover advantage also in, like exists for brand deals and sponsors. You could take a look at where sponsors are putting their money, what other channels, and reach out to them and say, hey, our channel is growing this much. If you get in with us, you'll get, you know, like, like a, a better deal or I see you're spending this much and we have these formats that align to what you're already spending on. Second mover advantage for building a business, putting out content, there's just so much stuff to study and people who jump in and they're like, no, I wanna do it from scratch or whatever. It's like, why make it harder for you? And by doing that, then you find the places that you can be even more creative and build on like the advantage of being a second mover and seeing that the dust has settled in this way and not that. A lot of people talk about copy and paste, which is like one side of the spectrum which you should not do, which is like, oh, you're hoarding the credit, you're just copying word for word, that's not good. Copy with taste, as I like to say, is like blend from different sources, share the credit, um, and just try to elevate the past. And so one thing I saw is that on Vogue, their channel, they're doing this thing like 24 hours with a celebrity. And it's just like a more raw version of an interview with somebody who's like more, um, just like, you know, you usually don't see them in that setting. So I logged that in my memory bank, and then I was like, okay, I saw this thumbnail of Mr. Beast when he gave out at Private Island to his 100 um, a million subscriber. And I was like, okay, there's something interesting about that thumbnail where it's him and an island. I'm never gonna give away an island, but that visual was very interesting. And then I had a chance to make a video with Danny Duncan, who, you know, we, we went all out. We went on a helicopter tour of all these different like places that he bought, businesses that he's like started to build. And so I took that concept, 24 hours with, 24 hours with Danny Duncan was my ad ad adaptation. I took that thumbnail concept from Mr. Beast and the copy with taste of those two things outside of my industry made for a video that now has 3.2 million views on my channel. So for context, I'm a surface pattern designer, which means that I develop work for use on products like fabric and wallpaper and stationery. And so when I was getting started, I really felt like there were these two different directions that I could go. I could either focus on what was marketable, what was trending, what I knew would sell if it was in my portfolio, versus this 
kind of tug in my heart to just do whatever it was that I wanted, like creating the beauty that I really wanted to see come alive in the world. And I decided that feeling that kind of reflection of my soul and my work was more important than like reassured success. And so I went, I went all in. I kind of closed, put my blinders on and closed my eyes to what was, you know, trending at the time. And it has paid off so well. And it, I think it, it paid off in terms of, okay, it's successful. But also for me, it means that my work is so incredibly meaningful. And so it's just brought a lot of joy to the work I do. Well, one of the things that it allows me to do is build in story to my work. And so while you see my work, you might not know the story right off the bat. You can always know that there is one. And that is a way that I get to reflect kind of my life and my passions and what I believe and all the, like, the travels that we go on and things like that. And so when someone who's using my work also knows the the story it just um, makes that connection so much deeper so I think probably the best example of this is my membership community the lab it uh, was working really well I was getting members in and people were excited about it and I actually put a cap on the total number of members that I allowed in like literally capped <laughs> the ability to bring people in and um, that was scary and challenging because like literally putting a cap on revenue that you get from this one product but it enhanced the experience of the members. Actually, there was a point where we got near the cap that a lot of people joined all in one month, probably a little bit because of like FOMO. And what's been really powerful about that was when people became actually like disengaged from the community, maybe it wasn't a fit anymore, maybe their priorities had changed, I was able to literally buy out the remainder of their membership and then open that spot back up to somebody else who could come in and be active. So like on one hand, you think, wait, you're taking money out of the business to clear a spot, but then you know more than that came back in from somebody who was excited to join. And when we hit the cap, we actually raised the price a little bit too. So everybody that decided to leave for whatever reason was replaced by somebody else who was excited to come in there and at a slightly higher price point. So it actually had a net positive impact on revenue, on the member experience, on the entire thing. So it seemed really unconventional, but it was, uh, was really positive in a lot of ways. Well, it's not really a, a story, but maybe just advice of like leave beginner or mid-level creators alone and just go for, you know, the high level people. My heart didn't feel good with that. And I rebranded and recreated to cater to those people. And that is completely against the advice that's going around the industry right now, where you go where all the money or the people that have money or, and I get it, but for me, my heart wants to help the people that really desire to make a change in the world, but are really afraid to step into their light and do so. I've seen it pay, not, pay, pay off because I still get to attract those people who have done all the things. And so me showing up for beginners still, even in some way they see my light and they realize, oh, there's an aspect of what they do that I can help with. Most email marketing is designed for things, conversations at scale, right? I'm gonna send an email to thousands of people and out of those thousands of people, hundreds of people are gonna click a link and of those hundred pe hundreds of people that click a link, tens are gonna buy a thing, right? That's like kind of like email marketing, standard email marketing. The problem is nobody starts with a giant audience. And so most people start treating their emails that way because that's what everybody else does. But the, everybody else they're following has like 10,000 or 100,000 or a million subscribers. And so it's a different strategy. A little context here. I have a program that's focused on helping people sell high ticket products, like premium programs. My, some of the promise of my program is I will help you earn $10,000 or more per month from a new sold out premium program. So I'll literally send an email that says, hey Tom, would you be interested in working with me to earn $10,000 or more per month from a new sold out premium program? Dash John, no link. And people will just reply and be like, well yeah, tell me more. So it's people that have small audiences that would typically assume they can't get, the, they can't get premium results can if they take a different strategy. I mean, I've done that myself in my own business, but one of my good friends and clients, Justin Reekman, he's done this now where last year, at the end of the year, he had 670 email subscribers and he earned $505,000. In March, he earned his first $100,000 a month and he still has less than 1,000 subscribers. Totally unconventional. And it's because he sends a hand raiser every week. The hook changes different. It's not, it doesn't always have to be one or two sentences. So sometimes it's actually a little longer, like a story, but then it's like, would you like to learn more? You know, people do things like reply coach to let me know. It's like, well, you wouldn't do that if you were like texting your friend. Like you were like, hey man, you wanna get coffee? Reply coffee if yes. <laughs> like you just wouldn't do that. 
And so we don't do that in these emails. We write it like you would write it to a person. Back in November 2022, I've been we've been running StoryGrid for a while, my partner and I, and we just hit this wall. Like we had this big promotion we were really excited about that we thought a lot of people would be excited to join. And it was just super flat. And I just felt kind of in my gut that something big was wrong. And I've been in online marketing a long time. I've been selling stuff on the internet a long time. I know how to do all the complicated funnels and sales pages and all that kind of stuff. And I realized that that was actually keeping me like this step removed from the person I was trying to help. And I was talking to a friend and she was like, tell me about your customer. And she started asking me all these questions and I realized I didn't really have good answers. So she's like, you need to just start talking to your people again. It's been a long time because you've been doing all of these other things. And so I just started having one-on-one -on -one conversations with the people that I was trying to help, asking them what they cared about most, who they were, why they did what they did. Uh, we work with writers, so why do they write? What do they really care about? And I got rolling with this, and after a while, I started looking back at all the answers, and I just started realizing, like, oh, all these interesting things that I, I didn't know about my people. And so I just kept going with it. And so now it's been 18 months since I started doing that. I believe, you know, this year we're gonna, we're scaling up, we're up, we're gonna go up at least 71% this year. And it all comes back to like, I intimately am aware of who my customer is and why they matter and, um, and what, they, what matters to them. To see even more what professional creators are doing, particularly when it comes to their email marketing, then check out this video right here where we share what we've learned from sending over 112 billion emails on behalf of creators. We'll see you over there.